I'm Malcolm. Um, you may have heard of me from such projects as Django. So <laughs> this is, um, to some extent, like over-promise, under-deliver, um, purely due to time constraints. I was just saying to Jacob, the last time I gave this talk, I had 90 minutes, and it was a smaller ORM. So um, <laughs> the idea here is we do it sort of graduate level style talk. We start out with there's going to be something everyone understands at the beginning. We'll gradually pick up the pace. And by the end, probably even I won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I'd like to give you an idea of you know if you want to learn more, here's a way to go about it. I can't strictly teach you more in this talk, but I can at least give you the roadmap to here's how to help yourself, and here's how to work out the right questions to ask. And as I said in the abstract, like, you know, I'm sort of obligated to give this talk because a large amount of the complexity here is entirely my fault. Um, so I probably should own up to it. <clears throat> this is who I am, just to, you know, I have, I've been around for a bit. I'm quite old. Um, but in sort of Django terms, I may have been the first person to sort of dive into the ORM who had a lot of database experience. Um, I started using something called DBase2 which became DBase 3 and DBase 4 back in the 80s, which wasn't quite SQL, but was close. It was almost like a COBOL-like language that was like SQL. And then use Ingress and Postgres and MSQL and things like this before we, I think I used Postgres 95, which was the first Postgres release. And I've been using Python for a while. It was called Python 1.4 when I started. So Python 3 is quite a shock. I only just got used to Python 2. Um, and yeah, I've been using Django for a while through fortunate happenstance. I had absolutely nothing to do with the original creation of Django. Most of that isn't my fault. But I got involved enough early on that it's hard to deny responsibility for some bits of it. And I've probably dabbled in everything. I mean, I started out learning the code like most people probably should have, just sit on the mailing list and try and answer every question. Um, you learn a lot. OK. It's 2012, September 2012. So not everybody has been using Django since the day it was released anymore. I mean, few, four years ago, five years ago, we could, everyone had been using it since forever. But a little bit of history just of the ORM um, and sort of how we got here. I put the time in here just because it's funny. Adrian was working late that night. Um, this was the commit that they basically moved from the internal um, Lawrence Journal World subversion repository into what became public Django. This was a Tuesday, 12th of July was a Tuesday. And the Friday of that week was when they sort of made the announcement of open sourcing it. It's very, now that we've got a Git repository for Django, you've all got the complete version history of Django on your laptops. It's very funny to go Git log minus minus reverse so that you see the commits starting at the earliest ones and just read through the earliest few commits. Well, maybe not so funny for you, but it's, it's amusing in hindsight. <laughs> Um, you see things like in the first dozen commits or so, remove Jacob and Adrian from global settings.admin. <laughs> um, <laughs> various things like this. So um, this, this is only here because later on I'm going to confess to slowing down the release of version 1.0. But just notice the year on this one. Um, this was part of a continuing sequence of optimistic predictions about when 1.0 would be released. Um, and yeah, I, I had something to do with slowing this down. But understand at this point, whoa. at this point, we, um, you know, Django had been released in, you know, back here, 15th of July 2005. So it had been around for a few months. We had something resembling what is today's ORM. You know, if you looked at the code, it would not look particularly unfamiliar. The implementation would look entirely different. And again, you've got the Git repository, you can check it out. You have to spend a while trying to work out where the code is, but it's there. And the code looks basically like it does today on, on the user level. And at this point, you know, it's not completely unjustified to think maybe we're closing in on something that works. People had been happy for a few months with the API. You know, this is what attracted me. You dive into the tutorial. It was only three parts at that point. You could do stuff and query the database. And I was coming to this from the point of view of someone who was working, had worked in a company with, you know, multi-gigabyte databases, using Postgres on sort of some fairly serious systems, and, you know, I felt that this, w this looked useful for me. It didn't feel like a toy API. Um, May 2006, there was a fairly big disturbance in the force because a whole bunch of things that have been annoying various people landed in this same magic removal branch. If you've sort of come to Django in the last few years and keep hearing about magic removal, this was the, the moment. This change is highly backwards incompatible was, in fact, an understatement. All code you had broke at this point. Um, 
mostly because Django previous to this did magic imports. Like you sort of, your models appeared under an entirely different part of the system to what you expected. But the relevant bit for this talk is Django DB models query.py appears at this point, um, including two functions called parse lookup and lookup inner. And if anyone ever looked at the ORM back in those days, um, they, I mean, these were good. This was a guy called Robert Widoms did a lot of the work on this, sort of factoring out the initial um, ORM and teasing it out into separate files. And this stuff worked, right? I mean, it, it basically did work as advertised on the box until you went too far, but it mostly worked. It worked enough to suck you in. And um, the main problem with it from sort of like my perspective is it worked with strings. Like it basically said, okay, we're constructing a SQL query, so it's gonna look like select something from something where something. And it tried to fill in all these somethings all at once, which meant that if you later on had to go back and change the tables you were selecting from or something like that, well, you couldn't. Um, it constructed things like exclude queries by just taking everything in the where clause and putting a not out the front of it, um, which, again, worked for simple things and didn't work at all if you had ands or ors in the exclude bit. Um, but for most purposes, it, you know, it worked. I don't want to be too critical of code because, again, it's, it's hard to do this stuff. And you know, Jacob told me about a year after this that it's sort of amazing it worked as well as it did. And I don't want to be critical. I just say Jacob and I agree a lot. Um, and it's got better. And the, the, my point here being it, we started from a good base of the user experience was pleasant enough that it was worth participating. Late July 2006, sort of a couple of weeks before OzCon of that year, I was getting very frustrated. I'd, I'd been sort of committing randomly um, for a couple of months, committing unsupervised. And I was getting fairly frustrated with, I was continually bumping into lookup inner particularly. Like this was this huge recursive function that did everything in about, I don't know, 200 lines, 300 lines. And it was just becoming harder and harder to untangle. So I sort of thought, well, OK, maybe I can restructure this a bit more, get rid of the strings, restructure this to be a more Python objecty inside, and then right at the end, we'll create the string that is the SQL query. It felt like the obvious way for me to do it. Um, talked to Jacob and Adrian. I came to OSCON that year and met those two and had a chat to them about this. And you know, no one laughed too hard. Um, and so I had a few attempts at this. And this took a while. This is why I put up the thing about the 1.0 release earlier. It, it sort of, you know, there's a couple of years between, or a year and a half between this point and when it landed. And I had a, few, mostly because I had a few shots at this. The first one was my computer science geek took over and I did it all with relational algebra, projections and selections and things like this. And it was awesome. I really liked the approach. It felt clean and neat. And at some point though, it was, you know, I felt no one but me is really gonna be able to maintain this or be willing to maintain this. You think it's complicated now, right? I mean, it was, it was, it, it just had that smell that this is only gonna get more complicated and you really, really have to like relational algebra to wanna to go this path. A um, Couple of years later, just skipping ahead, I, I had a chance to see an early version of the Discuss code base and Jason Yan, the CTO there, had used a very similar approach for some of their internals making me, so maybe we're, we're lucky that Jason was busy doing Discuss rather than working with me on the ORM rewrite <laughs> or it could have been gone the way I wanted. The second version I tried about, we're not talking about that, it was a very, very bad idea that, I mean, it, it, it looked neater, but it was slow and clunky and I, I kept thinking, oh, I'll just make it faster later. And every time I went back to make something faster, it got worse. So I chucked that in about January of 2007 and went back to a little bit more, to me, it feels like there's too many object, there were too many objects, data structures floating around in what we've got now, but it's the nice balance point between functional and maintainable and performance effective. July 2007, so remember, we're sort of a, a year later here at this point, I merged the Unicode branch. Now, there was the main reason for this was I was up to the point of integrating with all the database backends in the query set refactor branch. I was working in an entirely separate branch at this point because first step was break everything and then make it work again. And it was very, very hard making Unicode, making sort of, I want arbitrary data types to work with the databases. And then I got to making the MySQL interaction that was so painful. I thought this would all be easier if I knew I had UTF-8 coming out everywhere, which means Django has to understand UTF-8. Oh, great. So that only took a month. Um, and it also bought me some goodwill because this thing had been going on for a while and suddenly everyone had a new toy to play with that sort of Unicode worked and all of Eastern Europe loved me and things like this. So. Um, <laughs> I bought some time at that point, as well as making my own life easier. 
And a couple of months after that, it sort of it got to the point that I could happily announce, even on the Django users list, of you know, if you want to try the query set refactor branch, try it. It should basically work. Um, and I got a lot of feedback from that. You know, that's the point at which you start getting a hundred times as many people using it, so maybe a grand total of two hundred people. But you know, I was getting some fairly serious feedback from people doing reasonable apps. Um, 27th of April, 2008. <laughs> now, I've switched the times out here. This is 27th of April, my time, so in Sydney, Australia. Because I remember this day. I can remember where I was sitting. I can remember the weather. You know, this is the end of <laughs> almost two years of work. And I spent all morning merging this and pulling out the damn ticket numbers from track and formatting the numbers. Because the, the, the hashes down the bottom here are ticket numbers in track. And it's not just for ego purposes, although that was funny. It also was the trigger to track to close all these tickets. Um, track was sort of unresponsive for about 15 minutes after I committed this <laughs> to Evie, um, running 52, like there's 52 tickets there, and it was sort of running 52 simultaneous processes, closing off tickets. But at that point, it's sort of real, right? You know, I, I mean, I have to give credit to a Jacob and Adrian Russell, particularly, the, the other sort of core maintainers at the time, was they were being very patient waiting for this to finish, I mean, and helping out. But you know, this was one of the things blocking 1.0. We were going to get this right. So we did this. A few months later, like we, we sort of went to alpha of 1.0 about July of 2008, move forwards, 1st of September. By the way, understand, today is what, the 5th of September? So um, four years ago and two days, Django 1.0 was released. Um, a few days later, that was a Tuesday, a Tuesday evening. In fact, the, the time there is literally, you know, US East Coast time. So about 8.30 at night, Kansas time, James did the commit. That's the commit that bumped the version number to 1.0. A few days later, Google held DjangoCon, the original, the first DjangoCon, 2008. I gave the first version of this talk there, um, apparently. It's on video. I don't remember much about it. It's not a complete tissue of lies. I went back and watched it a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's still mostly relevant. I mean, there's no aggregate support in the ORM at that point. Um, and there's a couple of annoying people pop up at the end asking questions. But if you, um, most of the talk will actually give you more depth than this one, and it's still pretty much relevant. So, I mean, all joking aside, it's worth probably watching that if you can put up with a hairier version of me um, talking about the, the details. January was a big deal because we'd had a Google Summer of Code project going on just before 1.0 that we correctly decided not to rush and merge, but was to add the aggregation support. This is things like count and average and max and min and stuff. Nicholas Lara did most of the work for this. Um, Russell Keith McGee did most of the supervision. I stayed the hell out of the way for various reasons, but partly as a proofing that somebody other than me could actually work with this code. And Nicholas really, all credit to him, he did amazing work coming up with something that, um, you know, when I looked at it, I felt this was actually pretty good. And Russell sort of, at, at the point the Summer of Code project finished, Russell did a lot of work on working with Nicholas to tidy it up and then sent it to me amongst a whole bunch of other people. I probably sent him back about 5,000 words email of review comments and we trimmed down some things. But by and large, this sort of proved the concept worked. It was possible to extend the ORM to some extent. It was, you know, people other than me could understand it. Um, they're still around, you know, they didn't run away. So, you know, this was, this was actually a sort of a big step on a, on a social level. So right there I've covered, you know, two years, two and a half years of, um, so July 2006 through this January of 2009 of work. Was this worth it? You know, it's, it's a long period of changes and, thank you. All right. um, ultimately, I think yes. And all right, this is opinionated, and I'm far too close to the problem to really be able to say yes or no. But since then, the code structure has remained fairly stable. Now, this could be because it was really good, or it could be because absolutely nobody has the backbone to go in and change it. And you know, end of the day, it still works. I'll fall back on that. The, to me, it still feels roughly correct, and I'm pretty much my own worst critic here in terms of questioning what I do. So it still feels like I would do it again the same way, in, unless I went the relational algebra approach. Lately, and again, I won't be critical, it's not my code, but I'm looking particularly prepared for this talk. I know there's a lot of duplication in various places starting to creep in now, or near duplication, not exact duplication, no one's that bad. But the aggregation stuff adds a few things, like there's, there's various bits where you go, you know, we're doing the same thing here and here. Not quite the same, but maybe close. So this might be how I spend Friday and Saturday this week, actually, I haven't you know, dive in and start doing that. And the code flow is mostly logical. It's not 
the order of functions in the files are not necessarily great. I was, when I was sort of tracking through things, I realized it goes a bit funky where you, you start in the middle of a class, then you go backwards, and then you go forwards, and so on. I'm not quite sure what possessed me there. It probably should be, really be, you know, enter at the top and keep working down. But by and large, you know, as we'll see in the next few slides, we're about to dive into some actual practicalities. It does make sense in some ways, and I feel I can probably convince you it makes sense. So what's actually going on? Oh, the other thing I want to point out just before going too much further here is there is still the, the goal of this query set refactor landing, and the sort of point I've gone into, the reason I've gone into a lot of this history is we were doing this at the time I merged it, there was about 20,000 people on the Django users mailing list. So let's call that sort of an order of magnitude of the number of people using Django at the time for something. At the point you land any change that big, and this is a 6,000 or 7,000 line patch plus things like the Unicode change, which was a couple of thousand lines and so on. Some people are going to get upset because their code is going to break, sometimes due to bugs on my code, sometimes due to bugs in their code that have now become explicit errors. Some things are just going to be we made a different call to the way they wanted it, and some things are just going to be it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a ripple in the pond that you don't necessarily need or want if you're trying to use Django for real things. So there are certain things we did not polish at the time, like field classes did not really change very much during the query set refactor because that was above the the query layer. Um, certain other things, related, um, related fields did not change. There's been, since day one, sort of comments all over those of, you know, if anyone wants to fix these in some unspecified way, we feel they could be better. And I, didn't, I did nothing but make them work again. You know, I, I, I didn't want to polish too many things that didn't need it. The idea was, going forwards, we would then polish them. Maybe that hasn't happened as much as we'd like, but, you know, the world keeps spinning, never too late to start. So you know, what I'm going to focus on here is what happens in the next, the rest of this talk is what happens at the point you make a query. So you're doing you know, filter, blah, 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 or exclude, blah, blah, blah. What happens? At some point, this talks to your database. So you know, what happens between here and there? By the way, and for what follows, and for my own self-defense, if you're looking at the code, just remember, you know, it's very easy when you're looking at messy code to go, you know, what were they smoking when? This is, and not just for my case, I mean, there are many people who've contributed to the ORM since it started. Most of the things in there are not done by crazy people, or completely crazy people. Um, they are done for a reason. You tr maybe you don't agree with the reason, maybe there's a different way to do it, but it was not for frivolously mean, evil reasons. Um, <laughs> So you know, give the developers some credit. When you're trying to work out something, you go, I can simplify this by replacing these 100 lines with these three lines. I'll probably assume you're wrong, because we weren't that dumb. Um, there might be, you know, we're probably missing some test cases or something to show why that's bad, but you know, be suspicious. Here is you know, the kind of layers from most abstract down to least abstract. And I'm only starting here at the point where you're starting to do ORM interactions, not setting up your models with fields or things like this. So imagine you've already got a model, you're trying to get some data out of the database or data storage. First thing you talk to tends to be managers.py, query.py is up there as well. That's all public API. Next layer down is in the model slash SQL directory where we have the sort of implementation of the generic SQL version. The idea being here that if someone was to, you know, write, if someone really wanted to replace the ORM with something that talked to a non-relational data storage or an RDF system or something, they'd be replacing the slash SQL directory with, you know, their own code. Right down at the very low level, we can't abstract everything away from the databases. Postgres is different from MySQL, is different from SQLite, is different from DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, and so on. We do have various DB backends things. Base.py and operations.py are two files that exist everywhere there, providing certain last mile translation down to the exact database thing. Base.py tends to tell us, you know, how do we specify a, a wildcard in this database? How do we specify a date conversion, stuff like that? Operations says how do we do, you know, certain extraction features. It's not always clear to me which one, what goes in what, so I tend to use grep a lot, but I'm stupid. Maybe there's some logic there. I didn't actually do the database backend refactoring. That I think Russell or Jacob or someone led on that one, and it's sort of it's logical, but it's not. I can't predict where things are. I put some line numbers in there. Um, this code, there's a lot of code in there, and I'm not. I mean, there's a lot of lines. There's a lot of comments as well on whitespace, but 
These aren't short files, and that's unfortunate, but again, I'll claim reasonably necessary. It's complicated stuff. It's complicated because the user layer is easy. OK, wow, that's smaller than I was hoping. Um, <laughs> barely fitted it on the slide, but here's the type of query we're going to be um, talking about here. You know, imagine you're filtering for all the articles where the date is less than today, and it has maybe a related model that's the author where the byline is anonymous. Um, yeah, so this is the type of thing. I've intentionally put in a related field and multiple queries and so on. So you pass this to Django. What happens? There can be a few classes involved here, and I'm just pointing out where they are. Largely, these slides are online. There's a URL on the last slide. Um, so that you can say, you know, you can find out where we're talking about here. But from now on, query set is the thing you're mostly talking to when you're, when you're doing filter, like filter and stuff like that are methods on query set. So they're also mirrored on managers, but let's just pretend they're query set. Query is the deep dark internals and the heavy machinery. Where node is a node in a tree structure. So think of where node as a tree, if you like, um, for where clauses and also having clauses in SQL. Like it's basically the constraint stuff. And SQL compiler is a sort of auxiliary class that does the second last mile of converting things to SQL. It's responsible for creating the strings. So we do this filter. You do this filter call. Everything in query sets ends up getting converted to basically queue objects. If you think what queue objects are, if you don't know what they are, in uh, kind of like filter calls. Well, in fact, you could replace the word filter in the first line there with queue. Queue is a class, capital Q, um, that takes a bunch of parameters and can be used to construct filters. In a very neat bit of design, and I can say this because I didn't write it, everything gets converted to filter or exclude with queue objects. Um, meaning that you know we can uh, there's queue and there's not queue which is hopefully the name makes sense it's the opposite of queue it's used for excludes but the first thing we do is we turn filter into we call filter or exclude and say we don't negate and exclude calls filter or exclude and says do negate filter or exclude filter or exclude basically turns everything into a queue object either queue or tilde queue in the early days there was a class called not queue which seemed excessive and we just added an attribute on queue to say whether it was negated or not and you can now do tilde queue and it works. The idea with queue objects is you can also do or and 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 combine them together in sensible ways. So all this does, filter or exclude, is basically we do a couple of method calls to turn everything into a queue object. At this point, filters and excludes have, are no longer the, you know, different. Everything's the same. Add queue, now we're talking to the query class. This is the deep, in, the sort of the internals, not the deep internals yet, but the first layer of internals. And it says, OK, we're going to add a filter to the query. And queries, query sets are associated effectively with a model. Like an attribute on a query set says, I am the query set for an article model, or a blog model, or a person model. So query sets implicitly know about the root, the thing you're filtering. And a way to think about this is filtering takes the universe of all of your articles. And every time you do a filter, it reduces it to a smaller set of the original set of all articles. So when you have successive filters, it's just continually restricting this set. So filter is not a bad name at all for this. Add queue splits up its various keyword arguments into tuples based on the, the thing you're looking up and the value, which could be strings or it could be something like today, a Python object, where we further down we, we know, OK, if I'm a string, I'm a literal lookup. If I'm a Python object, like if I'm a callable, we need to convert it into, into, we need to call it to get back the value. If I'm a date time, we need to turn that into, you know, pass that through to the back end because the back end knows how to handle date times and so on. So it splits these up and on each one of them in turn calls add filter. Obviously, here and in successive slides, I am simplifying. Um, you don't get 1,100 lines in eight slides. You, and so there are things like how to handle negations and stuff like this, but I'm trying to give you the general path through the world here. So add queue ends up calling add filter on each thing individually. Add filter says, OK, we, I'm giving, I want to do author byline equals anonymous. So the fields I'm looking up are author and byline. And remember, this could be author byline underscore underscore contains anonymous or starts with anonymous or something like that. So there could be a lookup type at the end. But we're clever enough to know if the last word is not a valid lookup type, then you must mean the exact lookup type equals. If you happen to have a field called exact, this isn't ambiguous because you just go 
underscore, underscore, exact, underscore, underscore, exact equals whatever. So you know, the last thing is the lookup type, and the second last thing is the field. I say, obviously, you do that, but it's, you, have to win, you have to think of it. Um, <laughs> I sort of worked that out by reading the code. So anyway, it defaults to exact, the exact lookup type. But we always get a lookup type, we get a value, and we get a set of fields we're applying to. Two things happen here. We bifurcate. First thing that happens is we call setup joins. Now, these are all, this is all code I wrote, and I hope the names, you know, setup joins. What does it does? Duh. -huh. It sets up table joins, right? We're in SQL land here. I can start talking about SQL-like concepts. We're going to be joining, you know, the author table and maybe the byline table. Like at this point, all the query knows is these are string specifying fields. It doesn't know what type of fields these are. Do they refer to other models? Things like this. Although there's kind of the implicit thing that at least author here better be referring to another model because we've got something coming after it. So we call setup joins. Setup joins constructs an internal data structure. There's a big internal data structure floating around here called alias map. Alias map maps aliases, amazingly enough, to a sort of tuple representing um, you know, a join between tables. The first one is always the, the top level model. Remember here we're talking about articles. So the top level table is going to be something like app article. I'm cheating to fit things on a slide. I'm calling it T1. In real life, the first time you use a table in a Django query, its alias is itself. We don't actually give it an alias. This is an historical artifact um, because way back in the day before query set refactor landed, all, there were no table aliases. And I didn't want to break existing SQL in case people were doing hacky things. Um, so the very first time. But here, you know, aliases are, could be T1, it could be app article, whatever. But if you see T1 and T2 floating around in your, in your SQL queries, this is where it's coming from. So the very first row is a bit fake because it's not really joining to anything. App author, in this case, remember we're joining the author table to the article table. OK, it's got, a, it's got an alias of T2. It's an inner join back to um, the author table, back to T1. The field in T1 that is connecting is maybe called the author field. The field in table 2 that's connecting to is called the ID field. I'm just making stuff up here, but that's the idea. It's the left-hand column and the right-hand column. The false on the end says whether this is whether it is possible for this join to be nullable, meaning whether it is null equals true. This is not this is because at the moment it's an inner join, but later on we might need to promote this to an outer join if it could possibly contain null values. Um, the way we could the, the point here being that on a practical level, inner joins are much faster than left outer joins or outer joins. So we always use inner joins until we until we can't prove that we won't be trying to match null values. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff in the, in the query code that's things like if you see promote alias or, um, uh, sorry, promote join, that's going to run through a bunch of joins here and promote them all to outer joins if they're nullable. So that last thing is just a flag saying this can, this can never possibly be null. So there's no, never any reason to promote that to an outer join um, because it's always going to contain values. So that's a, that's a data structure. I mean, I'm only highlighting this here because if you're trying to work out what is going on in my code, I'm, I'm working on the query, I'm working on the ORM for some reason, what is the state of the nation at this point, printing out alias map is generally not a bad way to go. There's also something called alias reference count, or, um, which is, again, a, a dictionary mapping aliases to reference counts. I'm not subtle with my naming. Um, that gives you an idea of, you know, that can, again, help you with the state of the nation at various points. So setup joins is responsible for working out those various links. It's a dictionary, but providing you start from the, you know the model. Again, every query set's tied to a model. So you know the model when you're coming in here. So we know the table to start with. And if you like, it is a depth first serialization of a tree of table joins. Uh, so it is possible to actually turn this back into a tree if you do a little bit of work. Um, I've done that a lot of times on pattern paper, trying to work out complicated things. The other thing that happens when we go add filter is we're adding a constraint because we're really saying, you know, I want this, after doing all this connection, I need to match a particular value. This is where the where clause comes in in, in SQL. You know, I want to go select blah, 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 blah from particular table joins, you know, article joined with author on, you know, article.author equals author.id, um, where 
um, byline, author.byline equals anonymous. And so this is where we add something to the, um, we add, we pass in the lookup type, we pass in the value, dot, 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 um, disguises no end of, of mucking around there of complicated data structures. I mean, one thing that I'm not particularly in love with about this code is there are a lot of parameters being passed around, but this is because it's fairly generic functions at this point. In the background, I mean, at, at some point, this is all that is happening when you're turning a filter in. It goes, join the tables, maintain the internal data structures, which is pretty much just an alias map, and set up the constraints. Now, setting up the constraints means you've got to handle nulls. I'm sort of glossing over nulls a bit there. We've got to handle nots turning. When you go not of A and B, it turns into not A or not B, a few things like that. But by and large, that's all that's happening. When you do aggregates, which leads to grouping by and having clauses, a having clause is basically a where clause, so it does similar things. You know, the same code gets reused. Um, this is all sufficiently generic that something like the contrib.gis code, which uses its own, has its own extra database types and stuff like that, um, can use the exact same sort of code to pass things in. Um, there's not a huge amount of code duplication there. It's mostly subclassing and adding things. I should point out, while I was doing the query set refactoring, it was very useful. Justin Braun was following along behind me with his own personal GIS branch um, against query set refactor, which was a test that we could do, accomplish certain things, and sometimes he'd accomplish them, and I'd look at it and go, I don't want code quite that ugly in here, so let's rearrange the API. Um, so it was good in, in two ways, that things were possible and they felt right in some sense. And also on day one when we merged um, query set refactor, the GIS stuff just worked. The values have worked that were similar to what they were before. So what's going on in the background here? All these aliases in the alias map are being reference counted because we can sometimes trim a join. If we go, if we're doing something like where, um, I don't know, where, where this, this table joins with this table and the ID is something, we don't have to join with the table to check the primary key value. We can just check it back over here on the left-hand side of the join. So we don't really need that right join. And joins cost money, so you know, decrease the reference count and we don't have to include it. At the end of the day, when we're assembling all the SQL, the only things that go into the from clause are table aliases that have a reference count greater than one. So there's a bunch of increment reference and decrement reference stuff going on in there. Stole all that from Python, makes sense. Order by statements can add extra tables because you can order by things in related models as part of query set refactor. Possibly shouldn't have added that feature, but now it's there, it works. Model inheritance can add um, extra tables. Definitely shouldn't have added that feature, but um, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really didn't think through. Um, as I was saying before, the having clause in aggregates was, is very similar to the where stuff, so you can reuse some of the machinery. And apparently, as I discovered this time, has to duplicate some of the machinery. That's possibly a, an architecture flaw that I might look at later on. Query set aliases can be changed because we can have nested queries now. If you're doing the exclude of a, of a compound query, it turns into a nested query by necessity. If you're doing a um, uh, there's various other cases you can have with nested queries and you want aliases to be different. So we have a function called bump aliases. I was running out of names at that point. Um, so they started to get a bit exciting. So this is something like take all of the T prefixes and turn them into U's. And then if you have to bump alias on that, turns them into V's and so on. Similarly, we can merge query sets. This is if I'm doing, I have a query set and I have another query set and I and them together or all them together. If you don't know, that's actually possible. It works providing they're of the same model. It now works. It took a while, but it works. Same tables can appear with different aliases. I can sometimes join to this table to select a value or join to the same table and select a different value. Um, bit of an advanced use case, but it, it's there. So you can have the same table with different aliases in there. Things like select related, defer only, these are things that affect the columns we're gonna select when we construct the query. So initially they're just being carried around as flags where one of the flags could be nothing has been specified, so give me everything. Um, and then in the SQL compiler, it, it sort of works out which columns do I actually need based on, I think, o defer gets turned into, like defer here means don't load these columns yet. Um, it's an Adrian special that he wanted for some reason. Um, and then only is saying only load these columns. And so we turn defer into all of the columns minus the things you're deferring. 
and only just gets left alone. So they only, they only get handled right at the very end, but we sort of pull them through and track them. Cloning of query sets happens a lot, as noted here. This is every time you go dot filter on something or dot anything, we, clone the, we return you a, a cloned copy of the query set. This is useful when you really, really need it, and most of the time you don't care. Um, but it's always been this way. So you can go, you can take a query set and you can split it up into, you know, do multiple things with the query set and they don't affect each other, which is useful because under the covers, we've got a lot of internal state here. But as I say there, like query set dot filter dot filter gives you, you know, three different clones. It's quite fast. If you look at the clone method in query, query dot clone, you will see some interesting meta class hack, meta programming going on there. Trust me, it's valid Python. Um, the problem is there's nothing like memcopy in Python. So it's still slow because there's a lot of attributes here. We've talked about for a few years now adding like a no clone, some, somehow something like no clone that says, I'm about to call filter and you really don't have to bother cloning this. Trust me, I know. Um, Jeremy Dunk actually did a lot of the work, um, a, a bunch of sort of proof of concept of this in about 15 minutes, I think it, two years ago. And I've heard nothing of it since. So Jeremy, suck it up, will you, and just finish this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that could be useful in sort of high performance situations. Finally, here's what happens when you're actually executing a query. You build up all this massive internal data structure. Wonderful, right? Lots of work. Constructing the query is actually not that hard. It's sort of routine boring stuff, I have to say. But it's, and it's important. Get it wrong. People complain. Trust me, shoes get thrown. But it's... Basically what happens is we call the iterator. The first time you need a result, iter calls iterator. By the way, if you don't know, the iterator method on a query set is the real thing that does the work, except it doesn't cache the results. So if you know you just want the results once and then we'll throw them away and you don't want them cached in memory, call iterator specifically. It returns you an iterator um, and it just throws away the results. Whereas the iter method, the default method, so if you go for blah in query set, also caches the results in memory. So when you iterate over them later, it doesn't have to talk to the database again. Iterator calls get compiler, which gets the compiler, which creates the string as SQL creates the string and then has an execute method that actually talks to the database. So it's turtles all the way down at some point and then you get rows being returned back. Normally, unless you're doing something really funky, you're normally pretty lucky in that you don't have to delve around in SQL compiler and even the database backends. It just works. If you were doing something like, I don't know, you wanted to write something like PostgreSQL array support or something, you might have to write your own SQL compiler class, subclass. And that's fine. It's not, it's not horribly difficult. Um, fun exercise. Which brings me to this. You know, if this inspires you to do anything, you're going, OK, where do I start? Well, one option is look for track tickets in the database layer. That can be depressing. But it, look, it's, I don't want to. You know, I want to set expectations here. It's fairly hard work. It's also incredibly rewarding work, and tens of thousands of people will see the results of your work. So, you know, it is, it, is kind of, it is kind of worthwhile, but it's not something you just spend 15 minutes on. But things like queue objects, we can create, you can create custom queue objects. Hooks have been in there for this since forever. You could do things like support funky field types, Postgres array types, things like this. Look at the add queue method and see what it expects on these custom queue objects and write one just for chuckles, right? Think of something funky to do. Similarly, look at expression objects. These are the things that allow delayed field lookups. So you can go set this field to this field plus one. Um, write something, you know, play around with how they work and write subclasses of those. That, that again, I can say that's awesome code because I didn't write it. Russell and Nicholas wrote this as part of the um, aggregation support. And again, it, it has a very nice API that makes it very easy to subclass completely undocumented because it's kind of internal and we aren't very good at, we, we sort of intentionally don't document the internal stuff lest people fall in love with it. But I'm really thinking I want to commit some documentation that says, you know, this is internal and may change in an entirely separate part of the docs just because it's hard to read the code sometimes. But those are two, a couple of things. For example, if you wanted to get your feet wet, doesn't affect anything else, doesn't require a patch to Django, it can be entirely, entirely external, but it, you know, you will learn something possibly to never look at the ORM again, but you will hopefully learn something a bit more productive. All right. Sadly, we've run out of time for questions. All right, we maybe have time for a couple of short questions if anyone has one. And the, I've uploaded the PDFs to that um, thing. Daniel Lindsley, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Back that way. <laughs> hey, Malcolm. 
Um, so a question I have for you is, uh, something I've long wondered is, why is group by so hard? I mean, you can do group by with the ORM currently. It's like you do dot values, and then you have to do like an order by or something. I'm just curious, was okay, there a database so, reason for dropping that, or just not present in the previous API? Well, or? no, so it's, it's, uh, it's because that's not what the ORM does in the sense that group by is a very SQL specific concept to some extent, group by and having a sort of the pair there. They are a consequence of trying to select some object somehow, right? So if you're wanting, yeah, it, it, the, the question sort of comes, okay, I know there's something I want to do that would require me to use group by at the SQL level. How do I lift that up to a nice sort of API? Now, how group by and having are implemented under the covers is a little bit, a little bit complicated. I don't want to say messy because it's not my code and I suspect it's complicated because it has to be. Um, yeah, aggregation is where group by and having fall out naturally, and it seems more complicated than it should be, but I can't see how to make it less complicated either. So, um, you know, there's maybe some, some room for thought there, but it's, it's certainly difficult. Yeah, the question is how, I mean, the question I would approach it from an ORM layer is, what are you trying to do that requires group by, and how do you lift that up to a, a nice API rather than saying, how do we expose group by? Russell and I have both taken strong positions against exposing group by and having. Um, and we're four years into this position, so it's, <laughs> it's, you need to ask a better question. Like, yeah, you need to, you need to, <laughs> you need to ask the question differently. Sorry, you need to ask. You need to let Jacob ask a better question. <laughs> it's much worse, I'm sorry. No, I mean seriously, you need to. You know, the question is not quite the right question to ask. But talk to me afterwards about why you need this. Um, okay, so this is a massive question. And I apologize. Do I need to take a seat? Or yeah. Go, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you. So the original point behind um, the query. The, there's there's the query Django DB models query, and there's Django DB models SQL query. And the point of that switch, as you mentioned, was or that split was that theoretically you could kind of throw out that entire SQL directory and replace it with another implementation of that internal query object. And, the, and thus query against non-relational, some yeah. other stores. Yeah. Do, you act, do you still think that that's possible? I think it's possible. I'm not sure it's easy or neat <laughs> at the moment. I, I think, wait, we see, I don't think my position's changed in, since the last time you asked this question four years ago, is um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it certainly should be possible. Like I've tried not to rule it out. We're almost certainly missing some, even some internal API to make that possible. The Python fights against this a little bit because you're sort of using dynamic, you'd be creating dynamic classes that aren't top level classes, so there's pickling issues and stuff like that that make the implementation a little bit fiddly. But yeah, I, I, I still, I, I'd still say I don't think we've ruled that out or I've ruled that out in the code in any way. And there's work to be done to make it possible. My hope has always been someone sufficiently motivated to do that should be able to at least throw up ideas. I mean, I'm happy to help implement stuff. I'm just not quite sure what it should look like. Um, so I may be punting on the fuzzy wuzzy portion, but <laughs> yeah, that I, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, I think it's possible. I will fully concede it's not at all easy or even necessarily obvious, um, but I'm happy to sort of sit with people and talk through ideas. I don't, I, this isn't a case where I have a secret idea in my head of how to do it and just haven't got to it yet. I literally don't quite know how to do it beyond having intuition it should be possible. Thanks. Um, so my, my question is asked both from the point of view of the user of the ORM and the potential maintainer of the ORM. Um, it's reasonably easy uh, if you do something a bit complex with aggregation, et cetera, to just uh, completely blow up uh, uh, in the ORM. Uh, and uh, so we have this common answer, which is, OK, just drop to raw SQL if you can do it with the ORM. But still, well, there's the accept expectation that while you use a public APIs and you change them one way or another, it's supposed to work. So it's how sure, do yep. we draw the line? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, what do you mean by blow up? It actually causes an exception and crashes? Uh, no, but typically, uh, just to give an example, if you aggregate on two different fields on the, on the, of a related table, you're just going to have a double square join or something. And <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy to bail out here and say aggregations are a special case. <laughs> but um, yeah, there are, there are some cases like that. And for a while, we had selecting, I'm not even sure what the current state of play is here, things like um, 
doing select related on multiple related models, like many to many models, things like that, right? Prefetching is hard because you don't want to get n squared number of rows coming back by accident. Yeah, there are some optimization cases there that I would say don't do that if you need, or someone needs to work hard on it. The aggregation one, I don't specifically know the case you're talking about. I'm, I'd be willing to concede there might be fragility in there that you know, perhaps could be fixed. I, don't, I think the ORM should not ever be, I, I, I would feel unhappy if we say it blows up at some point. I don't think that's a reason not to use it. We should fix the reason it blows up. I'm happy to say there are certain things you can't do with it, perhaps, that are specifically database specific or can't do yet. Um, and that's why we have the drop down to raw SQL if you need it type of thing. And we shouldn't be pushing people to raw SQL. I mean, less and less you should be going there. But if you have to think for 30 minutes, how do I do this with the ORM, whereas I could write the SQL in 10 minutes, <laughs> write the damn SQL, right? I mean, there's not, it's meant to be a tool, not a, not a straitjacket in some sense. But blowing up cases, I think we should just fix, right? That's, that's inexcusable from a maintainer perspective or indefensible, it's excusable. We're all volunteers, but it's, it's not, you know, it should not be a feature. So the ORM supports left outer joins for some value of left outer joins. Um, like if you join across a one-to-one uh, -one field, yeah. you'll, yep. you'll end up with a null or an object. Yes. So what's the leap that's required to select all of the related models that you want with a left outer join? Um, do it in a single query. What do you mean all the related models you want? Select across as many tables as you want and end up with the models instead of uh, related values. Ah, you do end up with the models, don't you? So if I go select, if I go select related on a field, I get back that field points to a Django. You get back a Python instance. You don't get back a a value. But I'm talking about adding in adding in related tables that you where you specify the join condition yourself. Ah, uh, but again, that's okay. So this is like the answer to Daniel's question earlier. In some sense, you don't want to. We don't want to expose SQL. At the, the, the sort of general principle, I mean, I'm saying this opinionated wise, but the principle here is where the ORM is a persistence layer. It's not a way to avoid, it's not a way to replicate SQL. So, you know, what is the particular use case or what, what is the particularly major case where you need to specify? Yeah, we, there is support in the ORM, there's support in the set class, for example, to have different join types. There is support to be able to add join types with particular other values. It's all, it's all there. It's not exposed in any way because no one has yet come up with a compelling enough use case for why, how this should be exposed in some sense. So again, this might be a case of, you know, talk to me or male Django developers, preferably the latter, so there's more people on it. Um, you know, what is the case where you need to be able to specify this? Because you know, if you know how to do it in raw SQL and the ORM doesn't support it, that's the case where you do it in raw SQL, right? If you know you need to do an outer join or a right outer join. But the number of cases where you need a full outer join is a bit funky. I mean, there's a cases where, yeah, you, we only join on one column at the moment. We don't join on multiple columns, for example. Uh, but that's not quite your question, but that's, something that's being worked on, it's difficult, it's fiddly, but it's not, it should be supported. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry, I haven't really answered your question, but I'm not quite sure what the bit that should be exposed here is. All right, last question. So the generated SQL is really, really ugly. I'm wondering oh, didn't. how hard do you think <laughs> it would be to simplify that? So maybe one easy solution or one easy chunk of it would be for a query that uses a single table don't use aliases at all. Well, it doesn't use aliases at all. In the generated SQL? Yeah. OK, two, two tables. <laughs> 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 well, hold on. For hysterical reasons, historical reasons, rather, we, um, <laughs> the first time we use a table, we don't give it an alias. We use the full name of the table. Um, and this is largely your fault, because <laughs> the first time around, you know, in the initial ORM, it didn't use tables, and so because of extra, people were able to refer by tables by name, being the string. I didn't want to remove that feature because I'd break Ellington or something, right? And, um, <laughs> so <laughs> it was, yeah, I, I, there was a limit to the number of arguments I was willing to have on the mailing list at the point I merged this. So the first time we use a table, we don't give it an alias. Um, unless something's changed super recently, I don't think we give it an alias. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for interrupting, but I think my question still stands with there's only one table. 
we qualify all the field names. With ah, the name. right, I, right. Sorry, okay, this wasn't the right word. Okay, sorry, I understand. In the select, the select clause, yes, we're qualifying it. Right, and again, that's your fault. Um, <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> or possibly Simon's, or possibly Jacob's, but it was oh, it was there when I got there. <laughs> now, yes, there is no reason we couldn't do that. Um, in fact, that wouldn't even be particularly difficult because we only generate that string for SQL at the very end of the day. So we know at that point how many tables are involved. Um, so yeah, that would not be difficult at all. Um, Excellent. Now I think about it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. yeah. But this, hap I, just for the audience, this happens before, right? He makes a request that ultimately gets traced back to a poor decision five years ago. <laughs> Someone else does the work. <laughs> okay, I'm done, thank you. Mm -hmm.